Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to assemble, to be able to do your business. So Father, we ask you just to bless this time, God, that you're glorified in and through all that's said and done, and for the impact that will happen post even this meeting on tonight. We'll be careful to give you the praise, careful to give you all the glory, and careful to give you the honor. God, we count these things as done in the master's name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, those who are tuning in Facebook Live and especially a good evening to uh, all of our guests here um, uh, on this feed tonight. Uh, welcome to uh, this conversation part two. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a, a very engaging uh, conversation <coughs> about uh, uh, how we lead and how we in the Black community respond to uh, the disproportionate uh, amount of uh, misery and even death in Black Boston. Uh, Blacks represent about 28% of the total residential population. But a uh, study just came out uh, two days ago that says that um, African Americans or Blacks represent 42% of those who've contracted um, this, uh, this, this virus. And so uh, many of us in, in, within the Black community have been thinking about how we join the conversation and engage in deep dialogue and begin a process where we uh, do some visioning um, in terms of where do we go from here. So we were pleased to have a very robust conversation uh, two weeks ago, two Thursdays ago. And we're pleased to, uh, with some of our leaders and we're so happy to have uh, reached out and um, gotten the attention of other leaders within the Black community to have uh, another uh, installation around the conversation. Uh, we do have um, the, the uh, transcripts from our first meeting that, that we're making those available to, uh, to the leadership uh, with the goal of combining what was said two weeks ago with what will be offered here tonight by each of each of uh, uh, these community leaders. So thank you leaders again for being a part of this. Uh, we wanna have very serious conversations about where do we go from here? What does the community look like, the black community look like uh, 24 months from now, 48 months from now, um, given a response that, that um, given a response that we would that we like to uh, make beginning with um, these conversations over the last couple of weeks. So again, thank you for being a part of this. I'm going to hand it over to our our incredibly capable moderator, Carol Copeland Thomas. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you, Jeff. Durham for all the hard work that's gone in, not only for the first segment, but definitely for the second segment. Uh, you can imagine we're all uh, juggling and all of our balls are up in the air, but yet we have taken time to talk about this issue, come together in a meaningful way. And I thank you very much. I'm very happy to work with you, Kevin, for also working with the New Democracy Coalition of Massachusetts. Jeff, who was producing this show and your entire organization. Um, yes, I would say for those leaders who are listening, please contact New Democracy Coalition. Uh, we'll give you that uh, email address or contact information throughout the show. Definitely get a copy of the transcript. It is eye opening. Our first speakers, physicians, uh, activists, leaders, um, politicians, ex officios were a part of that conversation and that really provides the foundation for what we're talking about today. Where do we go from here? We know the facts, we're living through them. I don't have to tell you, I'm sure like you, I've lost friends from COVID who are now deceased because of this disease. So it's not a matter of theory or rhetoric, this is real. And I know people who have been laid off, including my own daughter after a 12 year run with her organization, other friends who have been laid off. I know businesses that are closed. So I don't have to tell you in terms of what the circumstances are for all of us. It's a matter of how we can collectively work in a meaningful manner where we can move ourselves forward. Now, with the exception of our first three speakers, 
we have a, a portfolio of the best of the best in this area. I'm going to ask for our other speakers and guests to please take yourself off camera so that we will focus on our speakers, our very first speakers. We're going to break this up into three segments. The very first segment, we'll talk about business and the business infrastructure in the Black community. And then we're going to transition into human services, which is also uh, the heart and soul of the Black and Brown communities. And then strategically going forward, policies, uh, civics, et cetera, public safety, and how that plays an extremely valuable part in our discussion tonight, all leading toward where do we go from here? The transcript for this will also be available as well as the recordings on Facebook, on YouTube, and on the association website, thenewdemocracycoalition.org, thenewdemocracycoalition.org. Kevin, if I'm not correct with that, let me know, and we'll make sure that you get the right information out. So without further ado, I want to introduce three amazing individuals who will open up our program looking at the dollars and the sense of what's taking place. She's a regional president of this wonderful bank. In, in, in a non-traditional role, she was selected for this position. She's also the executive vice president and chief experience officer of Berkshire Bank. She has been a longtime activist, a social, a serial entrepreneur in her own right, and she has led a number of socially responsible business accelerators across Boston. I don't have to introduce too many because of the fact that her work speaks for herself, but I'd like to first introduce our first panelist, Malia Lazu. Malia, welcome, and we'll move on and then we'll begin our discussion. Our second individual is a man of action and he's on the ground and can really talk to us from a small business perspective. He is the owner of Down Home Delivery. And I'm curious because I want to find out more about how is business now? What's going on with business? And, <clears throat> and what are you doing to keep yourself afloat as the owner of Down Home Delivery? We welcome you to this program. And last in this segment, we have the ex executive director of the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts. He's a man of action. He has held a number of roles within this organization and elsewhere. He's also run for uh, public office. <clears throat> and he's a Morehouse man, a graduate, 2012 graduate of Morehouse, Sigun uh, Aduwu. I want to also say we read your comments and please put your comments in the Facebook post when you're listening to this and watching this program, because they are a great benchmark for us as we are wrapping up and debriefing and figuring out where this town hall series goes from now, from here. So please, we'd love to have your comments. We will be responding to some of the questions in the chat room uh, at specific times uh, during the next uh, uh, hour and uh, 45 minutes. So please get busy and please share your thoughts in the Facebook commentary uh, marker. So Sigun and Gary and Malia, I'm going to first start off with uh, Gary and ask you, how are you, a fellow entrepreneur? Uh, how is business? What are you doing to stay afloat? Gary Webster. Hello, Carol. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much for um, having me here. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, haven't been done a lot, a lot of attention hasn't been paid to exactly what's happening to Black businesses in the heart of the Black community. So I'm glad to see this kind of forum come forward to at least give a voice to some of us. Um, you know, I, it, Carol, it, we started this business 10 years ago, actually, where we have Southern cuisine there and we do everything from Louisiana through Texas and all the way up through the Carolinas and Georgia and everything else, traditional comfort food. And my family and I started this business 10 years ago on a, with our own resources, our own monies, because if you look back 10 years, that was just about the heart of the recession started right. in 2008 or so. So no banks are w w willing to lend money to a fledgling uh, business, particularly not a restaurant in the heart of a, of a depressed area in the city of Boston. So we really went on a limb investing our own monies into trying to 
bring to Boston what I had seen for all as I traveled across the country, Houston and, and, and Los Angeles and New York and other places where they were quality black restaurants where you could go sit down, have comfort food, enjoy mm-hmm. music with your family. So we, we decided that we were going to bring that to Boston. And to date, We've gone through a period of changes up and down. As you know, most uh, uh, banks and places don't even want to deal with you. You haven't been in business for at least five years. So having passed that stage, we're now in 10 years now. So uh, thank God we, we've been able to. That's a milestone. Stay. It really is. And, <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's been a tremendous accomplishment by my family and others who've been vested in what we're doing <laughs> to date with all that's going on, and we don't have to recite all of that, you know, across this country, across this world, it's being devastated, business being devastated, period. But the black community and black businesses have been helped, and Latino businesses have been helped, hurt exceptionally hard. We're now able to stay afloat solely because we started this business on the premise of delivery and takeout. Mm. We had not fully invested in the sit-down capacity, even though I have 50 seats in the restaurant. Mm. We were starting to go towards the age and the, to, to, in the direction of bringing about entertainment, sit down in there and everything again mm. in the heart of Four Corners, which is, if you look around the city, one of the least developed areas in the city, but an area that I see has a tremendous amount of potential because it has space in the area to bring about urban renewal and reinvestment in the community. Right. So we kind of looked at things and wanted to do things looking towards the future and being able to hold on and benefit from those things. What I'd like to certainly say, Carol, is that development is going to come to Four Corners, to many of the depressed areas in the city of Boston, because as Boston continues to go forward and promote itself as an international city, and knowing that all the seaport district is saturated, all the downtown is saturated, growth has to come to the, to the neighborhood. And even that's going to change because of COVID-19. All the business plans, I'm certain of it, will be altered because we're in in a different space. Gary, have you found that your takeout business has increased in the last month? Uh, Talk to us about that. It certainly has increased in the last month, and that's and that's a natural uh, progression to people not being able to come out. We've added on Uber Eats, taking advantage of some of those carryout services. I have my own delivery service there that we built and branded our business on from the beginning, and then our takeout um, service also. And one of the good things is that starting the business on a takeout and delivery uh, basis means that we know the city, we know the ins and outs, we know how to get around, we know how to deliver a product, whereas many others had to change on the fly very quickly to Mm -hmm. try and adapt to the the, the impacts that have happened from the COVID-19. COVID-19. So we have indeed done a number of things to keep us afloat. So Mm -hmm. therefore, I've seen slight upticks in not only the takeout, but also in our delivery also. Have you applied for PPP, um, the the other program um, that uh, was available, um, EIDL, or the cash advance? Um, have you applied for that? I mentioned that because I, I applied for EIDL and uh, I got a little bit of money, <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> so what, what's that been for you? Well, let me tell you, we have applied for those things. And unfortunately, on the first round, we got absolutely zero. Okay. And, and that's been typical for most of the small businesses that I've spoken of. Mm-hmm. And it's just a, 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 a tremendous uh, disservice to all of us when you see Harvard University and the Los Angeles Lakers and Stake and Shake and those kind of places getting loans where small business like mine, where we've invested our life savings into what we believe in, we can't get, haven't gotten anything out of the first round of this. But keeping faith and knowing that the second round has come about. We have applied for those things, certainly looking to try and keep on 11 employees. I have 11 employees there at my business, 11 FTEs, Mm full-time employees, and four part-time employees. So, and half of them happen to be my family. So I have to be working very hard to keep these people on board and Mm -hmm. keeping them working. So the the PPE and the goals of PPE and the EDIL were certainly tailor-made for businesses like mine, right. but to see that the trickle down has not happened in the yeah. way that I'm sure yeah. the government wanted to roll it out to be. 
has mm-hmm. been hurtful not only to me but to a whole bunch of businesses in yeah. the city. I, I'm going to bring in. I'm, I love the progression of this. And before I move on, because I want to bring Malia Lazo in next, she's a banker. Um, but tell, give us your website. I want to promote you. So give us your website. So we're hit, hitting the weekend. People may have uh, money that's coming in. Tell us where they can order great food from you. We're at downhomedelivery.com and we're located at 2 Bowden Street, right in the heart of Dorchester in Four Corners. Uh, we have through Uber Eats and through our delivery operations, the ability to get our food out. I'm working with a uh, few organizations to help supply food to some of the elderly residences and some of the first responder units that are out there. So indeed, we're starting to work towards those kinds of things, but any sort of uh, new attention or focus towards not only my business, but all small businesses, particularly there in that area. I have a partner across the street from me that we work very hard trying to make sure we're two black men who own, <laughs> you look around the city of Boston, and find two black men who, who own uh, uh, any business in the city of Boston is particularly rare. So we're there working hard to try and bring about Great. change in four corners for my business as well as Super. others in the area. Give, give the website again. My daughter is behind me. She's my assistant, and I'll have her to put this in the Facebook link. So, uh, Gary, tell it to us again. We're at downhomedelivery.com downhomedelivery.com. Thank you so much. Carrying on the conversation, don't go anywhere, Gary. We want to bring Malia Lazu on. Malia, you've been on the outside and the inside. You're on the inside now as a great influencer. You're a regional president. Give us a sense of where things stand from your perspective when you hear Gary and, and others who are in the same predicament, and uh, where we stand in terms of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Malia Lazu, Regional President of Berkshire Bank. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, everybody. Um, You know, when you say I've been on the outside, it's great to be with Kevin Peterson, um, who has known me for long enough that we're not going to quantify the actual years, but, um, you know, is part of the community organizing network um, that I am blessed to be a part of here in Boston. And so this definitely is a unique moment to be a banker um, when you're an organizer. Um, And what I will say is from the very beginning of um, this outbreak of shutting down, we wanted to figure out um, how we could help. You know, as an organizer, sometimes it gets frustrating to be in institutions during times of great change. Um, And so Shagun, others reached out to me and we were able to respond to one, make sure that we were taking non-customer PPE, PPP clients. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that, um, you know, that was important for us to really prove that we could find companies um, that, you know, that needed PPP and we could run them through that process. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud that our second Um, PPP application was a woman of color um, for the bank, bank wide. Um, And, you know, we're also working on other ways to um, help people get access, which is really, you know, when you ask Carol, where do we go from here? Um, You know, what I'm looking at um, from the bank, because when you look at folks like Gary, um, Gary should already have access to other credit lines and to other things to help him get through hard times, whether it's COVID or not, because he's a company that's important to the community and important to our economy locally. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, PPP was a federal response, um, but what do we do as banks actually, you know, make sure that we're banking everybody Mm -hmm. and every small business in the same way? For, For those who don't know, because we have a wide range of people who are watching, PPP stands for Payment Protection Program, and that's designed for businesses who have employees to help them to get through this period of time. It's a loan to get through this period of time where when 75 percent of the loan is allocated toward salaries, paychecks, then the loan will be forgiven. That's the beauty of the program. For some people, they call it free money. Now, that sounds great, but it depends on the size and the scale of your business, whether it is beneficial to you or not. And you would think that Gary, because he's pretty much a takeout and delivery business, 
And he would be ideal for this because of his 11 employees, et cetera. So I wanted to explain that to you. The other program- Yes, and Kara, I'm sorry, yeah. can I just jump on that for a yes. second? Mm-hmm. You know, it was set out to be free money that helps people pay their employees whether they're working or not, right? So right. folks like Gary be able to maintain his workforce or be able to hire other folks to maintain his business needs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that we want to reflect on when we think of how we could have done this better um, is that banks aren't in the business of giving away free money. And we know because we've had conversations pre-COVID that banks aren't sometimes aren't in the business of banking people of color. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And so to have them be the dispensary um, of of this program, I think, was going to be with institutional and structural bias because the banking industry is fought with Mm -hmm. institutional and structural bias. So, um, you know, I think it was a great effort. Um, I think, you know, the SBA, um, you know, banks, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you look at the institutional and structural history of banks, um, the outcomes also make sense. Yeah. Full disclosure, uh, Malia Lauzo and I, uh, she's a friend, she's a client. So I work, I, I'm the, one of the consultants with Berkshire Bank impacted by COVID-19. So we had a whole roster lined up in March that's been pushed because of what's taking place. So full disclosure, a great person. It's probably time now to bring in Shagone. Um, Shagone is uh, the executive director um, for a wonderful organization, Black Economic Council of Massachusetts. Uh, Shagone, where is it from your perspective? And I wanna say thank you very much to Malia for your insight, for what Berkshire Bank is doing and for what your organization, Shagone, is doing because you have provided a pretty healthy list of resources for businesses to look at here in the New England, greater Boston area. So, Sigoon, comments and thoughts from your perspective. Sure. Well, first, you know, thank you, Kevin. And, uh, and Democracy Sigoon, just, just speak up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I just want to thank uh, Kevin and the New Democracy <laughs> Coalition for the invitation to join you tonight. And Carol, you know, being a legend in our community, the uh, opportunity to speak with you uh, is appreciated. And uh, I'm very happy to see Mr. Webster here. Uh, in fact, the last restaurant that I ate at before uh, the governor issued the stay at home advisory was mm-hmm. at uh, home delivery. Wow. Um, and we Mr. Like, Webster, we like you. We'll start uh, <laughs> delivering to Hyde Park. I'm happy to offer my paycheck to you uh, in full uh, uh, to support the business. Um, and of course, uh, in anywhere I can be with uh, Malia. And Monica and so many other people on this call is a great place for me. So I'm happy. I'm happy to uh, join you all tonight. So, as it relates to COVID, um, uh, Mr. Webster actually uh, uh, is is one of our uh, one of the cases that we're making uh, when it comes to uh, why it's important for uh, the federal, state, and local governments, as well as private industry, to invest in minority-owned businesses, uh, particularly Black-owned businesses. There was a Brookings Institution report that came out earlier this month uh, that uh, dwelled on the the Great Recession. And one of the key points in that report was that uh, in the recovery, uh, nationally speaking, minority-owned businesses added 1.4 million jobs to the uh, uh, state, uh, excuse me, national uh, economy. Whereas uh, businesses owned by white males lost 800,000 jobs and businesses equally owned by white men and women uh, lost 1.6 million jobs. Uh, And so Mr. Webster is part of this uh, uh, great statistic uh, that shows that minority owned businesses are the reason why the American economy is flourishing and healthy uh, and why we're able to support so many people today. And for us, the governments uh, either on the federal, state or local level ought to be uh, returning the favor. Uh, and so BECMA has done a lot of work on uh, all, all of these levels to ensure uh, that uh, these relief efforts focus in particular on black and brown businesses, uh, because we know that when uh, uh, the, uh, the minority business community is healthy, uh, the broader economy is wealthy. Um, so, you know, back in March, before all of this uh, got to the scale and level that we see it at today, we actually sent out a survey to our members to get an understanding of how uh, we were being impacted uh, by uh, the perception of uh, COVID-19 at that time. 
you know, we, we understood this quote that we've heard uh, everywhere and that we all grew up understanding uh, that when uh, America catches a cold, the black community catches pneumonia. I knew you were going to say that. I could, I could, I just, it's memorized, embedded, right. etched in our, in our heads. <laughs> exactly. And, and our whole history uh, shows it and our own daily experiences uh, reflect that, unfortunately. And so uh, we found at that time, 90% of our business owners, we have about 300 uh, uh, business members across the state, 90% were already experiencing a somewhat to severe impact. Uh, over 60% uh, felt that they only had cash reserves to survive up to 90 days, if mm -hmm. at all. 15% said they, got, they had nothing that the next day if they had to close, they would not be around. Uh, and over 40% of those who employed people, around 500 uh, folks uh, uh, that they employ, uh, said that they would uh, uh, have to lay off their staff if they wanted to survive the crisis. It needs to be understood that this is almost 60 days ago. So we know that those numbers are way higher and that many of these businesses have closed. So we know that our businesses uh, need um, immediate uh, and direct support. So um, we've heard the same things that, uh, that Gary has uh, shared here and that I'm sure many business owners and uh, 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 solopreneurs and uh, independent contractors would say that they are struggling an outsized proportion to other communities, mm -hmm. even though everyone is, is struggling at the moment. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll just say a little bit about what Beckman has been doing. Um, we've been advocating on the federal, state and national uh, local levels on the federal level. You know, uh, Gary's point about um, uh, not receiving uh, monies from either the Paycheck Protection Program or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Uh, rings true for there's a, a, a study right now that shows that uh, more than 90% of minority owned businesses did not receive any of the funding that came out in the CARES Act uh, a month ago. Uh, and so, and, and again, I, I just got a, a little bit, <laughs> exactly. not a lot, a right. little bit. Right. That, yeah. that we are not getting our fair share, uh, mm -hmm. as it were. And so, uh, Congress attempted to uh, alleviate this issue. Uh, and what they passed last week in their intermediary legislation, where they set aside uh, from that $310 billion, $60 billion, 30 of it to go to uh, uh, community development, financial institutions, minority lending institutions, credit unions, et cetera, as a way to hopefully reach uh, people of color, uh, businesses owned by people of color. Uh, but we know and knew uh, that this would not be the case, that at the end of the day, this program is first come, first serve. Uh, and uh, that we don't have all the necessary resources to get our stuff in order so quickly to be in line uh, first. So we've been advocating with many of our partners on this call tonight and, and others to uh, push our congressional delegation to uh, uh, ensure that there are a specific amount of funds dedicated for black and brown businesses, as well as monies for technical assistance, as well as data collection, because we're not right now, the uh, application for PPP or the EIDL do not require you to uh, say what your race or ethnicity is or mm -hmm. your gender, which is one of the first times that an SBA or a small business administration application has existed and has not and does not ask you for that information. And we wonder why. Mm -hmm. uh, on the state level, we've been advocating or, or pushing the governor and the legislature to set aside $150 million uh, out of the rainy day fund uh, and other federal resources. Uh, to um, uh, uh, four black and brown businesses in the form of grants. Uh, it was mentioned earlier uh, that, you know, that we need grants. Black businesses cannot take on loans, uh, either because we understand the history of predatory lending uh, mm -hmm. or uh, the fact that uh, we get put deeper and deeper into debt when, when we are forced to take out a loan. So we want them in the form of grants, uh, technical assistance and, and other things. And then finally, here on the local level, you know, we just published uh, an op-ed on the Bay State Banner uh, about what the city could be doing. And, and chief among that, you know, the city put out their grant relief fund uh, a few weeks ago, a valiant effort. We appreciate the fact that they removed a lot of the barriers that exist in other uh, applications for other funds for folks to take advantage of that money. We know that over half of the recipients were people of color. So, you know, we applaud those efforts, uh, but we know that the city needs to uh, raise more money to open that back up. But we also believe that the city needs to make this a continuing fund beyond COVID-19 that exists in particular for black and brown businesses. Um, you know, Kevin mentioned at the beginning that we make up roughly 28% of the population and, and a quarter of the businesses are owned by uh, black people in this city. Uh, and so we know that uh, again, we are the reason that the economy in Boston is strong and healthy. So, it, you know, the city ought to reinvest back in us. We're also 
uh, pushing for um, the fact that the city ought to be making sure that contracts uh, are going to black and brown businesses. A year ago, we uh, councilors uh, Janie and Wu held a hearing that exposed the fact that uh, less than 5% of the contracts were going to minority businesses, which is important to say, not black owned, but minority, meaning non-white. Uh, and when you look deeper at the data, uh, even uh, less than 1% of that was going to black businesses. Um, and so we wanna make sure that uh, black and brown business owners are given the opportunity uh, to not only uh, uh, provide goods and services in the COVID-19 crisis, but also mm -hmm. in the recovery efforts. So these are the things that we're doing and um, uh, on behalf of our members. And, and, and doing a, a superb job uh, also. Sigun, can you give everybody, again, we'll have Jeff or someone else to put it in the Facebook uh, commentary. Give us your contact information, where people can find out more about uh, about your organization. Sure, yeah. So we're, we can be found at uh, Beckma.org, www.becma.org. Uh, if you go to Beckma.org slash coronavirus, this is where you'll see the list of resources and funds that exist uh, to, to help uh, small business owners. We update that regularly uh, and are continuing, again, to, to advocate for more monies to be set aside um, uh, for our business owners. And, and, you know, Malia mentioned earlier a partnership with uh, Brookshire Bank. And I just have to say here again, and I'm going to say this everywhere I go, that Malia is the perfect example of why representation matters. Uh, and the fact that uh, when your skin folk are also your kin folk, amazing magic can happen. Mm -hmm. um, but because of her being at Berkshire, we were able to form a partnership uh, also with the Mass uh, L LGBT uh, Chamber of Commerce to establish the Futures Fund, which extends a line of credit up to $50,000 for eligible businesses. So it's specifically for uh, black and brown businesses or the, those owned by LGBTQ members of our community. So again, we appreciate uh, Malia and Berkshire and uh, again, at that uh, backma.org slash coronavirus, uh, lots of resources for business owners out there. Thank Carol, you Carol, so much. Yes. Just add just quickly. Go ahead, just, Gary. I appreciate the comments because again, while uh, it, uh, it would said that some businesses were not prepared, minority business prepared to put forward the application process. And that's in some instances. But for, for us, we didn't get into to be a small business on the corner. We certainly know the business end of it and have put forward all things that are necessary. And I have to get to know Malia because one of the things that has happened is even though I had a banking relationship with Bank of America, all of my merchant services accounts, everything, they perhaps take $20,000 plus from me in fees on a yearly basis. They did not consider me a, a customer that had a lending relationship with them. The wow. semantics of a business relationship as opposed to a lending relationship is something that they hid behind to take care of their customers first. And then therefore within the first two days, three days, all that money was gone on the first round. I hoped that Congress putting forward the second round would have pushed the details that said all lending had to come from the bottom up. That mm. All small businesses, I don't care if you've applied for $10, $1,000, that you get funded first. And mm -hmm. if from there, monies were left for other folks above you that they had the opportunity because they did meet the guidelines of what the, 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 the criteria were for some of these loans. But it's just an unfair process where the banks had the opportunity to determine who were their lending relationship partners and who were their banking relationship partners and those who had no relationship with them at all. And that's how they funded them throughout that process. This is, this is very significant. I'm going to bring Malia on next to respond. Very, very significant because the relationships are the key. And some people got PPP because they had relationships with their banks. There were some banks that weren't even equipped from day one to start the process. Now, again, I got a grant, but I got a grant only because a business friend of mine in New Orleans, we have a mastermind group together. She emailed me at midnight, said, Carol, jump on this now. And because I jumped on it, on April 1st, that is probably the only reason why I got the little bitty grant that I got, again, because of information and timing. But this whole piece about relationship is critical. And this segment we are spending, we're going to have uh, Malia to wrap it up with her comments. We're going to move on and talk about human services, bringing up Daryl Jones next and talk about employees. But we have to talk about black businesses first. I think in part because Boston is over-indexed with nonprofit organizations. They're my clients. They're my friends. Not knocking them at all. But there needs to be now 
a real emphasis on black for-profit businesses of which Gary and I are. Malia? Yes, yes. And so Gary, please um, get my email. Um, I would love to, to talk to you because I think that is the crux of the problem um, that you hit on was that the banks could decide um, how they were going to define the term relationship. Um, and, you know, we know who decides is, um, is really what matters. And so, you know, I think that it's, it's also important for us to remember that, right? Um, and remember that so many of us, us I mean, to Shagun's point, um, you know, we've been the backbone of this country. <laughs> Is it 500 years now? You know, I, I don't know. Close enough. Close enough. I, I don't know how many hundreds of years and who we support matters. Um, and just like, you know, we support black businesses. Um, you know, I couldn't agree with you more, Gary, that I think who your relationship is with a bank is critically important because your money matters and your fees matter. And, you know, my crazy idea around the SBA lending was that minority banks also should have been some of the first allowed mm -hmm. um, to give SBA loans. Um, you know, fees that these banks could use. Um, it would also create um, situations where, you know, we currently partner with minority banks throughout the country. Um, and so we were working with them on SBA, but it would have been a great time to build capacity, um, you know, for, for minority banks. So this was a redistribution of wealth. Um, it was, you know, 350 billion and whatever this next tranche is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as we keep on going, I think it's critical that we work with Shagun and, you know, and others um, to put forth policy that's going to make this work for us and really put the onus on the banks, you know, because what, what I can see is that, yes, you need to be able to service your customers. As you said, Gary, how you define customer hmm one thing yeah. um, and how you <clears throat> service to your customer is something else. And what I would argue um, is that we define service to our customer and making sure that our customers live in states, cities, and communities that are thriving, um, which means minority businesses and MLK Boulevard, as well as Main Street are mm -hmm. thriving, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Um, yes. And so I think that, you know, banks can, de can decide how they want to define customer, community, and risk. Um, and this was a great opportunity and continues to be a great opportunity for banks to lean in and bank people that they otherwise wouldn't because it's guaranteed by the government. Put so some true. Real, put, some so real true. Teeth, put some real teeth into the Community Reinvestment Act where, where banks are supposed to be looking in those areas, COVID-19 or not. And those are the things that haven't happened to the levels that they should have in our community already. Hopefully mm -hmm. going forward with people like yourself, Malia, and others, and we continue to work at this, we can get that focus um, back to where it belongs in the urban areas of this community. Great. Malia, will you give uh, any contact information where people can go to find out more about Berkshire Bank or whatever else would be appropriate. Malia Lazo. Thank you. So yeah, you can go to BerkshireBank.com um, to find out about us. And we also have a COVID response page that talks about um, the work of BECMA, but also talks about what we're offering to our customers. And, um, you know, that's important because I think it's it's important to show other banks do it. So why, you know, why if, if, if one bank can do it, other banks can do it, yes. right? Um, I, I think that, that that's important to, to show. And also you can reach me, <clears throat> I guess, Facebook wise or social media wise at Malia Lazu. Um, and um, if I can help think through anything, um, even if you're not in the state, um, we're all one community um, and where we go from here is together. Great, great. We'll make sure we put your information at Malia Lazu, which is your Twitter feed, I believe, Twitter handle. Yeah, all my all my mm -hmm. socials. Mm -hmm. So you can reach uh, Malia at Malia Lazu 
at Malia Lazu, and we'll put that in the Facebook um, uh, post as well. Thank you. She's not going anywhere. Gary's not going anywhere. Shagun is not going anywhere. Well, we're going to move on. We do have questions that are coming in. Please keep the questions coming. But we want to bring on this brother because he has to leave early. I don't want to slight anybody. Last time we were not able to bring Lisa Owens on and she wasn't able to join us this time. So I, want, I don't want to slight anybody. So we're going to bring um, Daryl Jones on now to sort of move and talk about human services. This, um, this has opened up brilliantly in terms of business and the black business community. We're gonna shift gears and now add on uh, employee staff development and the brothers and sisters who are behind bars who are also being impacted by COVID-19. Uh, Daryl Jones, as a prison activist, and I'm going to have him to share a little bit more about his history and what does it mean to function in uh, an institution or an organization where you, you're confined, you can't go anywhere, um, yet you are impacted by COVID-19 and the work that he's doing, obviously, on the outside with those ex-offenders, et cetera. Daryl Jones, thank you so much. Welcome to our town hall and share with us more uh, where you stand in terms of the work that you're doing. Daryl Jones. So um, let me just say that my name is Darrell. Darrell, so, thank you. You know me as that. But, um, and I, I'm sorry about not having as much time. Actually, I'm doing an interview on it. We're doing an hour with Dan Ray on WBZ tonight. Okay. And that's what I'm doing right after this. Mm -hmm. And to talk about this prison issue, because I get a lot of calls from a lot of the brothers that are incarcerated mm -hmm. when they come out for their calls from Shirley Max, you know, for various prisons. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding is that the anxiety is so high, right? You know, it, it's really out of control. And the prison system not allowing the public to get information. They've always been like that. So, you know, I've been, I was incarcerated, as, as some may know, you may know, for the last 30, you know, 32 years straight. And then I got exonerated and found innocent. So I was there when I wasn't supposed to be there for 32 years. So my whole life is really knowing that system. And my main issue is I know what it feels like and I know exactly what they do in times like this. And I want people to be mindful that. We had a major movement going on about the violence that went on there. There was an incident that occurred with the officers and the inmates. And even with the pressure of that going on, they were retaliating, doing things to those guys. So what do people think is occurring during the time that that got shut off? Well, what's occurring is that there's a lot of payback going on. Mm -hmm. A lot of those brothers are being retaliated against even worse because the public can't get information because they, doesn't have, they don't have access. In fact, speaking of that, um, one of the brothers, my brother here, Ricky McGee, who's at Norfolk Prison, did an interview on um, Channel 4, and he spoke over the phone. They retaliated against him for doing that and giving information out, moved him out of his cell, cut him, you know, so mm -hmm. they don't want any information out of there. That's how they've always worked. The brothers are in there. Some are living in cells together. People have to understand that, double cells. Prison is an environment where everything is suspect anyway. Mm -hmm. and everybody has, you know, various issues. And so a lot of fights and beefs are happening. You know, a couple weeks ago, there were stabbings, never been talked about. These things are occurring. Inmates living together are fighting, they, you know, because they're under the press they have never been under. I Meaning we've had lockdowns. They went on for a month, three weeks, you know, whatever happens, they lock it down. But normally somebody's coming out. No one's coming out. So they have so many issues going on with that alone and then they're not receiving the information and what people don't understand is when we're in the prison we don't have access to the information that people out here have access to we don't get the same channels they can't see this live so their information is what they hear mm -hmm. so they're hearing all kinds of things and the main thing that they're hearing is death you can die we're dying they see somebody else dying so it's almost panic mode, right? And if you see other states, you know, the prisoners are rioting and just, you know, really, really going into a thing. And we're subject to be in that same environment and those are our families in there. And the other issue is that, like I was, there are innocent men in there. And we talked about the issue of people getting released during this time. There are men in there that are at the verge of overturning their cases 
this is a bad time for them, you know? And we just had a brother in New York, just got out, and then the next day, you die. You understand? So so this, this, this is a terrible thing. What the brothers wanted me to get across, even to the community, was that we are asking that the senators who were going into prisons <laughs> could have access to go in. The, the prison is telling them no one's coming in, right? So they're not getting business access to anybody. Mm -hmm. We have to do something to mandate that they can go in. If they mask up, they should be able to go in and check those prisons, and no one's being able to get in. So mm -hmm. therefore, there's no watches over what's occurring. And, and that's dangerous for the community. Another factor is, although we're letting brothers out, people are not being mindful that a stimulus check may be coming to a majority out here, but those brothers are not coming home, or sisters in Framingham are not coming home to a stimulus check. So they're coming out with no money. Mm -hmm. The families are already broke, right? Let's mm -hmm. just say. And you know, and so they, a lot of them are gonna come home to their girlfriends, their mothers, whoever. That's a that creates a climate that that we just, you know, they're not ready for. Mm -hmm. No one is addressing these issues. You understand? And so my concern is that the community comes forward and we require something. There's not even a I work now for the mayor in the public safety department. There is not even an avenue for us to register them. My job was to be able to find out who's coming out, try to get them a job, try to put them in position. Right. That can't be done because now they're coming out without coming through the office. Mm -hmm. So they're coming directly out to the community. Mm -hmm. And when we look at these homicides and all these things that are coming home, hurt people hurt people, right? Right. So when we look at those things, we have to assess this a little better and have a better idea of who's coming out and what's the resource they need. Mm -hmm. you know, and we have to require some of the people that are in positions to do that. Yeah. You know? what, what, to, to give us a sense of yeah, I, I, your story, I, I'm heartbroken because I'm meeting you for the first time, having heard about you and seeing your resilience and fortitude all these years later where you did not give up hope. And I guess hope is what got you out ultimately along with the support that you were receiving. Can you give us a sense of how important hope is now for our brothers and sisters who are incarcerated, given their limitations in terms of the information that they are not receiving and how it can hurt them physically? Darrell jo uh, Darrell Jones. Well, one of the things is when you have to understand the process. So what's happening is there's <clears throat> hospital unit in prisons, right? And they move everybody upstairs to various prisons into those hospital units. But the hospital units stay full with people that are either already sick or the mental ill, right? Mm -hmm. Or people that are you know, committing suicide and trying to and various things like that. Now, mm -hmm. since they don't have the space, they're throwing the people up there, right? So just imagine you got corona or you, you know, you've been infected, we're gonna throw you up there. Now they're full. Mm -hmm. That affects all of it. So the, the, the issue of healthcare there is even worse most of the people just got, Norfolk Prison just got their mask Monday. Wow. You talk about, that's why I call a lot of people in place aftermath specialists. They specialize mm -hmm. in doing something after it's already went wrong, right? Wow. So, the, you know, being up there in that hospital unit and, and, and you don't have access to television, radio, or any of that. Mm -hmm. So it's the same way as being in segregation. So now when someone is in the situation to be moved upstairs and into segregation, you're also cut off. So now the same thing that might make you sick is now a sanction upon you, mm -hmm. right? Because segregation was made for violence or whatever occurs. Mm -hmm. But now you're living in segregation, right? access to nothing. So I know what that's like because that depression sets in, right? Mm -hmm. That loneliness sets in and then when you can't call your family or visit, mm -hmm. just imagine how much it's hiding, right. you know, has heightened. And right. so we don't, we, we just have to come up with some plan or have a community meeting like this to be able to bring these issues out that they can't get around. Is it the same for the women's prison in Framingham, which I visited many years ago? Uh, are they under the same restrictions as Norfolk, um, uh, Walpole, et cetera? They would all be under those restrictions. That's how prison works, right? Um, in fact, without saying the name, a young lady just got out, just got her case overturned, right? And she's been in for years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I talked to a lawyer today. She just came home with COVID, right? Mm -hmm. 
And she was just saying that she just left her tear in framing him. And no one seems to notice that her tear, a few of them have just, you know, um, got the COVID now or the conditions of it. Mm-hmm. And this is the type of information I'm talking about not getting out. Right. right? right. You know, if she comes home with it. So mm-hmm. imagine the ones that they would send home with it and not put the public on notice, not not do anything to help them or put them at a quarantine place like her. She's going right to her own mother's home. Right. So she's infecting. She's getting out, which is wonderful, but right. she's getting out with a virus that she will probably pass on to her loved ones as they embrace her and, and welcome her back home. So what what would you say those who are listening in the chat room is now blowing up on Facebook? Uh, what would you tell our audience in terms of how can we move the needle forward to not only think about our loved ones and, and those, my friends who have now passed away from this awful disease and others on the outside, what can you say to help us to be of encouragement and support and help to those on the inside, both men and women? Well, and all, all genders, should I say, all genders. First of all, let me just say, as you know, it's the will. First, you got to care about that situation, mm-hmm. right? And you can't take it as it's a separate community. Mm-hmm. No matter how much is going on out here, we can't sit back and decide, well, those are prisoners. You know, I got this going on right now. I got that going on. That mm-hmm. is still a part of this community and it interacts. And it's our time. relatives too. I mean, I, I know somebody in prison right now. So That's a right, couple right. of people. So those are our folks. And what's concerning to me also is that, and, and, and I probably have to go on this note because I really have to do this um, WBZ. In the yes. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to stress that when I was in prison, in 1991, two weeks apart, I lost my grandmother, and my brother. Then in 2009, I lost my son. I couldn't go to their funerals. I couldn't go say goodbye. That's what's happening out here in the world. But in there for them, not having phone access or being able to even see their people in prison and they're losing family too. Right. The disconnect is so great. They haven't set up a video thing. There's so many things that other prisons have at the federal system. They have video calling various things. We don't have any of that, right? So People have to try to understand how they must feel. Don't look at what the issue is about, well, they should be in a prison for some reason or what, why they're in prison. They're in prison to serve the time. So that's already been dealt with. Right. The right. reality is that there are human beings there and we have a responsibility. So what the community can do is more forms, maybe like this, maybe you can host another, and we talk specifically about the prison issue and when guys are calling me from prison, I can set it up and have some guys call directly from prison, things that we don't have, and we can interact and let them know, one, that we're on it, two, that we care, and figure out an avenue to get information. And if we can send in letters or you know, uh, uh, create a, a list or whatever, inmates will pass it among each other, something mm-hmm. from us, like the brother Kevin, you know, something from us, something from, the, from you, you guys, to be able to say, we know you're in there, we're out here, and they will pass it among themselves, and that provides some form of hope that they know what's going on, they're on top of it. We don't know we're on top of it, unless mm-hmm. they hear it from their families. We have to let them know we're on top of it, and we haven't forgotten. Well, I hope that they will know from you that we specifically wanted you to be on this forum to talk about the issues, not from theory, but what actually is going on. Darrell, can you give us a contact information? There may be some who will want to stay in touch with you who are watching this forum. Can you give us uh, any way to uh, stay connected to you? Yeah, I, um, so what I have, I have a service line, but what I'll do is give my email. So okay. my email is just met. Very unusual email, but just met, like you met someone, M-E-T-J-U-S-T-M-E-T, Nadia, N-A-D-I-A, at gmail.com. Just met Nadia, N-A-D-I-A, at gmail.com. So I'm going to... Because I see Kevin's face, just so you'll know, when I came home, this is how crazy it is coming home after I've been gone so long. I don't even know Nadia, never saw again in my life. I was in the store, in the Apple store. And they were like, the email, I don't know anything about none of that. So a young lady had Nadia on. I said, how about just met her? And they made that by email out of my story. I said, well, it works for me, <laughs> everybody else. Darrell Jones, thank you so much. We have captured it. Uh, we'll make sure that we put it in the Facebook uh, link. Go on, do your other show. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. God bless you. We will stay connected. 
And may I say that, um, you know, anyone after this, I think it's an hour or more, or go back and listen to it. But we're going to have families call in and whatever, and that's WBZ, and there's a call-in number, so I would just give it anyway if I could. Sure, sure. The call-in number is 617-254-1030, and it's WBZ Radio with Dan Ray, right? And we'll be started, in fact, in a minute. And then, you know, so if any families out there got something to say, we've passed the word to the prisoners so they can listen because radio they do have. So I'm hoping that some families will be able to say hello, you know, and let them know care about. Darrell said one more time, give us the phone number one more time. It is 617-254-1030. And we'd love for our audience to break away and call so that there will be a diverse audience, yes. not just Dan Ray's audience. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Darrell Jones. Thank really you. appreciate that. God right. bless you. Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. We have a lot going on. Let me just share with you some of the comments that are made, that have been made, and uh, see if woo, we're, we're, we are cooking in terms of comments. Um, one comment that was made, um, Salvatrice Hutton, U.S. Federal Contracts for minority small businesses is essential now more than ever. I agree. More minorities need to enter the global market to avoid solely relying on making profits domestically. So that is more of an international perspective. And um, she says, Savina June Martin, a great group of leaders, educators, artists, um, physicians, business leaders, and faith community addressing a myriad of issues in our Black community. Uh, also, Miss Johnson was uh, was asking about women in prison. We definitely cover that with Darrell uh, in his comments. Another comment, uh, we want to make sure that you know that this is being recorded. This presentation is being recorded, and you can capture it after the fact. We'll have links both for this Facebook feed, also for YouTube. It will be posted on YouTube and at the organization's website, and that is the new democracy coalition.org. www.thenewdemocracycoalition.org. You'll be able to get the information there. Let me read uh, one more comment here, and then I want to bring on our other guests. Um, Salvatrice Hutton. Uh, what do they do, Darrell? Call legislators? Well, you can follow up with uh, Darrell Jones, and he has given his email address, just met, M-E-T, Nadia, at gmail.com. Just met, Nadia, at gmail.com. I want to bring in one of our other guests now. We have our segment that we've moved into talking about human services. And uh, we have three incredible guests that we want to bring on with this segment. Uh, one of them is one of the hardest working women in greater Boston. She is feeding over 1,700 people a day and has been doing so for the last six weeks because of COVID-19. And that equates to a $3,500 expense bill every day, not every week, but every day, that's about $17,000 a week that she has to raise in order to feed the 17 plus hundred people that she is uh, feeding. There's been a documentary made about her. You can go to Lee Francois' uh, Facebook page and uh, capture it. He has actually created a, um, an amazing documentary about her and her organization is Violence in Boston. And Monica Cannon Grant, come on. She's in her car. She just came from Restaurant Depot buying products. We want to hear from you and tell us what is it like every day. You are out there. You're working. You're feeding people. Tell us what it's like in Greater Boston. Monica. Hey, so thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Kevin um, and Jeff. It, it's, it's, it's amazing and tedious and tiresome and all the things at the same time. Um, I'm in my car because we just came back from Restaurant Depot, and so we were trying to prep for tomorrow. But um, I guess, you know, I'll start from the beginning. We, I was watching the news, and the mayor had just closed the Elliott School campus. And I knew that sooner or later he was going to be closed at Boston Public Schools. Um, and so I called my friend, who is the owner of Food for the Soul Restaurant in Grove Hall, 
uh, Donnell Singleton, and I'm like, hey, D, he's getting ready to close schools. What's going to happen to the 5,000-plus BPS children that go hungry? Um, for a lot of them, the meal they have in school is their only meal. And then there are a portion of young people who ride the bus to school from shelters. Um, and I was like, hey, let's try to feed them. Now, when we first started this, I thought maybe 200, 300 kids max. The first day, we had about 850 to 890 people. Wow. Um, when we first started this, this was before we got to the point of um, not allowing people to even come to the restaurant. So we had them outside, and they were separated uh, by six feet, and ISD helped us with, like, yellow tape, and we literally had people lined up outside. And then after that first week, we shifted over to deliveries. Um, we have between 25 to 30 delivery drivers from the Boston Teachers Union, the Greater Boston Labor Council, some from the mayor's office, and then others are just everyday uh, residents. And we have four drivers coordinators that optimize the routes for the drivers to make sure they're not all over the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. I guess for me, one of the biggest issues is that we had to turn away a lot of people just due to capacity. So we received requests from Braintree and Brighton and Everett and Chelsea, and we just can't service those areas. Um, and we had to shut off our list of receiving people to sign up for meals as well, just because of capacity. So um, 1,775 is our max number. And we fluctuated between 1,500 and that number. A lot of families will let us know once their food stamps kick in or their financial benefits kick in, and then they'll tell us, hey, we have our benefits. We no longer need the services. But for the most part, um, people are extremely grateful. And listen, with anything that you do, there's good, bad, there's indifferent. And so we've had some people who just, you know, they don't actually need it. They just want it. And, you know, that's just part of the process. But it's been amazing. Um, we're able to do this work courtesy of so many grassroots donors as well as grants. Just yesterday, we got approved for the resiliency fund through the city of Boston. But prior Great. to that, we had the New England Patriots, Mass Housing, uh, the Boston Foundation, the Treffler Foundation, um, uh, State Representative Liz Miranda, State Representative China Tyler, um, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, just a number of different people who have donated but also have volunteered. Uh, and City Councilor Julia Mejia, today we had a donation from Councilor Campbell, and so it's kind of been all hands on deck. Um, and we do lunch from 12 to 2 and dinner from 5 to 8. Wow. How, how I want you to give your contact information also. How do you keep going? I mean, this is not your first endeavor. You were already on the ground doing amazing work in terms of your community leadership perspective. How do you do it day after day? with no guarantee that the money is going to come in. You're talking about, third, we had this conversation before we had this forum. And I, you know, I was just struck by 1,775 people you are feeding every day. It costs you $3,500 every day to maintain that level of, in terms of inventory and feeding people. How do you keep going, Monica? So every time when, so the, it seems, and, and I know it sounds weird, but I have to say it out loud. First thing I have to say is, but God, right? Because every time we get to the point where we start begin to get low, um, another yeah. grant will come in or uh, um, a check will come to the house and we'll be able to keep going for the next day. We only do Monday through Friday, so it gives us Saturday and Sunday to spend time with our families, but also it gives time for us to try to fundraise. Um, and grassroots fundraising is where I come from. I come from activism, and now mm -hmm. I'm shifting into organizing and running a nonprofit that I've had since 2017. But um, just but God, I mean, we have begun to get low, and then yesterday we got approved for the resiliency fund, and we just keep going. There are people who have donated from um, Cape Cod, the Berkshires, uh, Rhode Island, Vermont, California. Um, we've received so many grants courtesy of this uh, Fidelity Foundation where mm -hmm. uh, grant uh, people who have foundations can donate under that guise and they've been anonymous. So there's been about $5,000 anonymously given to us that we don't even know who the person is to say thank you and it's been nothing but a blessing. Um, but yeah, just as fast as it comes is just as fast as it goes. Restaurant Depot, BMS Paper Company in Jamaica Plain, Brothers Meat Market and Stop and Shop gets all our money. 
Wow. Wow. Can, can you tell us, give us your contact information where people can find out more and can donate to your very worthy cause, Monica? Absolutely. So um, you can visit my website. It's violenceinboston.org. If you want to donate, we are on PayPal, Cash App, and Venmo. So PayPal is paypal.me um, slash violenceinboston. Cash App is Mrs. Grant 38 Venmo is Monica hyphen Cannon hyphen one. All of these things are listed on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we're also on Snapchat. Um, and I welcome anyone to, if you know someone who is in need of meals, you can email us at violence in Boston, all one word at gmail.com. Um, right now we're servicing about 1,587 people. So we have a little bit of space before we hit that 1700 mark. So we have the ability to have people send us emails if they're still looking for food. The other thing is we're doing care packages. So for those who don't want to receive meals from us and want to be able to have the dignity to feed themselves inside of their home, I myself am going to stop and shop. And we've done about 30 so far of packages of hamburger, packages of chicken, milk, cereal, gloves, hand sanitizer, max, toilet paper, um, and products to make spaghetti and just whole meals and putting them in boxes and deliver them to families um, courtesy of referrals. So if anybody calls me and says, hey, I know a family that needs a care package, I go shop, I pack the box, and then I drop it off to them to make sure that they have it. And it comes with masks, hand sanitizer, and gloves. Also, those things can be found at BMS Paper Company and Jamaica Plain for those who just want to go purchase them on their own. But I think, you know, one of the things that I I haven't heard too many people talk about is um, social distancing is a privilege. When you deal with a lot of people in communities of color who don't have access to PPE and don't have access to the things that they need, um, I believe that we have a responsibility to give them those things before we start judging the fact that they are not wearing them. Mm. I did see that the sorority brothers were down Dudley, um, excuse me, Nubian Square today. Um, Representative China Tyler was in Nubian Square handing out masks, and it, it's amazing, and I'm grateful because um, when the young lady got shot a couple of weeks ago, Alyssa, yes. she was Yes. We went to the candlelight visual. There were 250 young people there with no masks, no gloves, no hand sanitizer. And so we we can quite often get in this space of sitting and saying, well, what's wrong with them and judge them. I just went through the crowd and gave all the young people masks, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer and gloves. And none of them fought me. They were excited and, and happy and asking for them because nobody has supplied them. And so I encourage us to think think from that mindset in this right, process. Right. So many Well, that's why we're doing this town hall, because we're all learning and the resources are definitely here. And and Monica's going, are are you going to be able to stick around or do you have to go and and do the prep for tomorrow or what's your time like? I can stick around till now. Okay, great, great. So we're going to have her to just uh, park and just relax a little bit. Um, also, uh, we're, we want to bring on, thank you so much, Monica. You, you've given us so much food for thought. I want to bring on Imari. Before we go on, Carol, yes. I just want to say, before I turn my camera off and my mic off, I want to say hello to Senator Diane Wilkinson. I see that she's on the call. How you doing? I haven't seen her face. I don't know how long. <laughs> <laughs> it's my sorrow. We're going to talk to her later. And, and sorrow, Diane, will you turn your camera horizontally, too? So uh-huh. we're, we're, we're going to get you in the next uh-huh. session. All right. <laughs> thank you, Monica. Thank you so much. Uh, she'll be with us. Let's bring on Imari Paris Jeffrey. She's the executive director of The Parenting Journey. It's a national nonprofit organization focusing on building partnerships and engagement to affect change in family systems. Now, it's a great segue because Monica was talking about families and people gathering for vigils, and maybe they don't have what you assume they have. So Imari, come on and and talk to us about the role and the leadership role that you have and how does this impact the community? Imari Paris Jeffries. Thanks for having me on, uh, Carol, Kevin, (laughs) Senator Wilkinson, great to see you as usual. Um, I I follow you. for you know, I, I don't want to say how long Malia said we don't give oh, please don't. of times. Uh, but, so I feel honored to be on here uh, this evening. And, and you know, I think Monica hit the nail right on the head. Uh, you know, Parenting Journey focuses on uh, providing therapeutic supports to families. Uh, and not only do we we don't stop at providing the therapeutic supports to families, uh, we try to impact policy that creates the conditions that families 
are finding themselves needing the type of therapeutic support that we, we are working with in the first place. Uh, I think we, we have been front and center in an illuminating racism uh, as a public health crisis. And so racism is uh, one of the major factors um, of, of conditions that support, uh, that impact families that, that we work with and that others on, on the phone uh, and on this Zoom call also work with our people in our community. Uh, and so social distancing is a privilege because when housing insecurity uh, in the city of Boston and Cambridge and, and the surrounding areas is an issue, families are finding themselves lodging two and three families in, in two and three bedroom apartments. We are uh, in Mari. I know the uh, internet speed may be impacted. That that happens sometimes. Imari, are you back? I'm back. Did, did, okay. I, did I lose you? Yeah, you froze a little bit, but you can keep going. <laughs> and, and so, so the, the the issues of the COVID has illuminated issues that have impacted our communities uh, before the virus. Uh, came about. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard people say that we're all in this together, and that's true uh, to a certain extent. Uh, we're all experiencing this together, but we are all in a, uh, in a different context in which we're experiencing this. Uh, and our community is, is more likely to uh, experience this in, in negative ways uh, than, than other communities. Hmm. I, 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 I want to tag team. I want you to continue your uh, train of thought and what you're saying. And in addition to that, I want to bring on Cuff Ferguson now. He is the uh, director of human services program at UMass Boston, long time in the field of psychology. And uh, I, I want to sort of piggyback on he's had a chance now to sit back and and listen to the conversation, talk about families as you're talking about Amari and listening to Monica and obviously Darrell. Uh, Cuff, can you add some value to the impact of what Amari just talked about, said, yeah, we're in this together, but not necessarily equally sharing the experience together. Cuff Ferguson. Hello, I wanna thank everybody for sharing all of their thoughts and uh, about this important issue. Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to, to share around this is that uh, when I look at um, the whole field, the thing of human services, you know, it boils down essentially to uh, services to human beings. And one of the things that when you, when you boil things, uh, uh, pull, pull things apart, what you essentially get to is that each of us in our own way live in what I call three life spaces, a personal life space, a societal life space, and a global life space. And they're all kind of like, if you can imagine uh, sort of interlocking or overlapping spaces, uh, if I don't have three hands, but if I had three <laughs> hands, <laughs> there would be interlocking. <laughs> and in the center of all of that is you. And I think about each of us as uh, sort of four, 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 four fold beings with a mind, a body, a spirit, and emotions. And when we're looking at the totality of that, we're talking about that human being having a very unique experience in the world. And when we apply it then to the black experience, uh, essentially we're talking about quite a unique experience in terms of the lenses through which we, uh, we are engaged. And we know that lens is a disproportionate lens right now. <laughs> so, when, we, when we're trying to, to um, even get at um, the whole issue of uh, providing human services, uh, we get to a point where we have to understand a little bit about um, our own power yeah. um, in this process. And a lot of times people are feeling disempowered yes. by, by the coronavirus. 
Uh, what I want to suggest, though, is that power itself is actually something that comes from inside. And we know a lot about resilience mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as, a, as a community. Right. And when we tap into that, we're actually engaging in uh, uh, tapping into our own inner power to impact on our surroundings and other people around us. I could talk a long time about uh, what that really means. I don't know if we have a lot of time for that. But being able then to tap into that inner source mm -hmm. uh, allows us then to be able to uh, uh, take care of ourselves. That's called, called self-care. Yes. And then when you expand that uh, larger to a larger umbrella, we're talking about neighborhood and community care. And much of what we've been, uh, and these, these have to do also with this interlocking thing uh, between the life spaces that we're, we're engaged in. So um, the perspective I wanna add around this is that uh, not everybody is, um, uh, no one is alone in this process. Mm -hmm. We all are connected in a way and connected in a very deep way uh, and coronavirus is actually providing us with an opportunity to tap into that human connectedness, mm -hmm. particularly within regard to uh, the black uh, the black experience around human connectedness. It's mm -hmm. really validating a lot of what of, of that human <clears throat> care that we have for one another. Imari, as you hear uh, Dr. Ferguson talk about the, the resilience and the power and the inner strength, you're working with families. Can you share with us what is the factor? Is there an X factor? Is there something that you're seeing now with families that despite it all, this is such an uncertain time period. It hasn't happened since 1918. Sadly, we're making the same mistakes that they made in 1918. The death toll is just going up every day. We're the third state in the country with the highest death rate and cases of COVID. How are families coping that you're seeing that we need to know about in order to move through this uh, period of time that we're in? Imari, Jeffries. You know, and I think Dr. Ferguson hit the nail right on the head as well. You know, I think, you know, one of the things that our, that our community um, is, is, is known for and that, that we, we carry near and dear to our heart. It, it, is, it is the Colonel's secret recipe for us. And that is our social connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, the COVID has allowed us to, uh, on, on one aspect, to reconnect with loved ones uh, and families that we work with and, uh, have communicated the, the positive impact of uh, being able to uh, connect with one another. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other important aspect of our community is the relationship, the ecosystem of our community. So not only our black businesses, uh, but our black nonprofits. And so I think in, in the earlier segment, we talked about the importance of strengthening black, black businesses. And, and I think the, the other piece of connectivity that, that we need to keep in mind is the importance of strengthening uh, black human services agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, 10, 15 years ago, we probably could count about 25 thriving black and Latinx human service agencies uh, that, that uniquely supported us from Roxbury Multi-Service Center to, um, to, uh, to Freedom House. And I mean, you, you name them, you know, we, we had our own agencies. Uh, and those agencies are probably, we were able to count those agencies on on one hand, and if you count the black and the Latinx agencies, maybe you could use both hands. And so w when you have an ecosystem of small businesses uh, that are hurting and you don't have a strong ecosystem of, of nonprofits uh, that, that are run by and that, uh, that the folks who work there look like us, uh, they, they don't understand our unique needs and they don't understand what connectivity means. And I think Monica was alluding to this uh, and, and the importance of relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we cannot programatize our way uh, out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't know the handshake and you don't understand um, what makes us us, you, you're going to have a hard time supporting us uh, and, and you won't be of the community. Uh, my biggest fear is when we think about the response, and I think there's been a lot of experts on here from banking to PPP uh, that are talking about the response. 
I, I'm worried about the rebuilding and the recovery uh, right. and the reconstruction. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, I, ho- I hope that some of us uh, uh, keep a little powder uh, in, in our bags to prepare for the recovery and the rebuilding and the reconstruction, mm-hmm. uh, it, because that is where, uh, that will be the, the, the second great tragedy of COVID uh, where our, our service sectors, our institutions are not firmed up uh, to support us, our urban leagues, our NAACPs uh, are not going to have the resources to support us in the way that they need to. Um, our other community organizations, organizations like Monica's, won't have the resources to support us uh, like we need to be supported. Uh, so I, I hope as we think about these interconnecting ecosystems, uh, both on the human level, mm-hmm. on the personal level, on the business level, and, and on the organizational, the nonprofit organizational level, uh, that, that we all keep a little bit of powder in our musket to prepare for the recovery and the rebuilding. And that is, that is really an important point because what my concern is, gravely so, is that the heightened awareness is going on right now. So people are now, maybe for the first time, realizing that, oh my goodness, there are healthcare disparities in the black and brown community. Oh my goodness, black businesses are suffering more than other businesses. Oh my goodness, black families, Latino families are also hurting. People in prison are, are hurting. And then one year or two years from now, after the virus vaccine has been discovered and distributed, nobody remembers, and we have a collective form of amnesia. Cuff Ferguson, what are your thoughts? Well, I wanted to, to piggyback on, on a number of the things that, that have been said, but I, 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 I wanna focus a little bit on the relationship issue, because relationships are boil down to uh, the importance of how we get things done. Mm-hmm. And when I look at the nature of relationships, whether or not you're talking about business relationships, uh, uh, other kinds of service relationships, and you scrape everything apart, what makes for a ha- healthy relationship? And this boils down to basically three ingredients. And I look at it as a triangle of these three ingredients. One has to do with trust. Mm -hmm. The other has to do with communication. And the third ingredient has to do with care, caring. And if you flip that triangle around and ask, well, why why doesn't things work? Why don't things work? Well, if you flip it around, what you see is that there are also three ingredients. The uh, the flip side of trust is mistrust. The flip side of communication is miscommunication. And interesting enough, the flip side of care, which I actually call love, um, is fear. Mm. 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 And a lot of what goes on, which keeps us from from getting things done, has to do with that flip side. Mm -hmm. And when I've been talking about this for some years, what I would say is that the way in which you began to turn that unhealthy relationship around to the healthy part is really through the area of communication. It has to be authentic communication, real communication. So when business folks get together, talk for real about what really is needed. When health, health uh, folks get together, have authentic conversations, be real about the disparities that are happening. Don't uh, flower, don't uh, put a, a, a sugar coating over it. Mm-hmm. Just be real and authentic about it. That creates then the opportunity uh, for changing that relationship back into the healthy part so that people are actually talking honestly, authentically, and then you can get to strategies, strategic tr- strategies that can work. And without that kind of communication going on, you fall short. And, and, I, think, and I think that's right because, you know, you know black folks, you know, we, 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 we are not a monolith. You know, we, right. we, we um, are uh, living our lives in this country across a spectrum. And so, you know, we, we, I think we have to have communications, not only about folks who um, are on the front lines and 
who are, who are going through it, but also our black middle class. Uh, I, I heard one statistic that, uh, that a black middle class dollar is really only five cents. Because, and you said this early, Carol, m many of us who, who um, are in the quote unquote middle class, I mean, we're just a paycheck away from uh, not, not being in the middle class. And many of us in the middle class are supporting our relatives, our loved ones, our cousins, our children, we have a person, but, we, but, we, but we're not gonna talk about that, right? Because you know, we're supposed to be something else. And so right. we, we, we are all in a similar context, despite not being a monolith. And when we think about the recovery uh, and the rebuilding, uh, we, we have to think about our entire ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. you know, how, do we, how do we lift our entire community? And, right. and how do we have honest conversations around um, what, what it means to uh, create education equity uh, what it means to create housing equity, job equity for all of us. And, and, you know, for some of us to not be prideful around, Hey, you know, you, you think I'm doing okay, but I'm actually helping five people out and I'm, I'm barely not okay either. And so mm -hmm. I, I might need one of those um, $1,200 checks, but yeah. you know, it don't look like it, but <laughs> I'm gonna need that check too. Yeah. Uh, Cause we're not having those honest conversations. So all of, all of us are, you know, all of us are in the same context. Yeah. And I think, what co one of the things that COVID did, I think it, it put a spotlight on it. And um, I, I don't know about you, I, I don't want to return back to normal. And mm -hmm. I, I think there's an opportunity uh, and, a, and a window that's open that we need to jump through and, mm -hmm. um, you know, re reimagine our, our demand power, our buying power, our key relationship power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Monica is talking about, uh, the, I mean, really talking about real, real cultural and community capital. I mean, hmm. that's what that is. I mean, we, we are rich in cultural and community capital and, and we need to start spending it. We yeah. need to start spending it in our businesses, uh, in our homes, in our schools. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alenka Bracero, you'll be you'll appreciate this, Amari and, and Cuff says the reconstruction after COVID-19 minority communities need to take the lead in rebuilding of our communities, housing, education, workforce and health care. And I think that the key word is relationships. That's what Cuff has said. That's what Malia Lauzo had alluded before and Gary Webster as well, saying much of the same within our communities. We're going to take it on home with our last segment. This moves fast. And I know we'd love to have four more <laughs> hours to talk about this, but I will get in trouble if I don't bring on my last speakers. I want to have Detective Larry Ellison with the Boston Police Department to put your camera on and, and talk to us about this important topic that we are dealing with in terms of our community, uh, building relationships, the amazing jobs that people are doing. Uh, what does it mean from your perspective uh, as a police officer and as a leader in, um, in law enforcement? Well, good evening. It, it's um, it's a lot to digest. You know, I was listening mm -hmm. to your, your guests earlier and just a few comments, if I could, just prior to that. You know, one of the things I think we haven't pl planned for is most governments, whatever, they, they have a rainy day fund. And I don't think uh, communities of color have done that well enough mm -hmm. uh, to where we're, we get into a crisis and we're depending on folks who historically have not bailed us out to now bail us out. Um, it's almost paramount law enforcement. Like, we know if we get in trouble, who's going to bail us out? Who's going to come and bail us out? That's why a lot of these folks are incarcerated, even over small amounts that they, their bail might be, because no one is coming to bail them out. Mm -hmm. So we really have to reassess what are we, you're right, the gentleman said about not going back to normal, because that's not normal. Um, mm -hmm. But we see a lot of deficiencies there. Um, you know, as well as, you know, what folks I think we need to pay attention to as well, Carol, is that, you know, the Senate is reconvening in a couple of days to try to push through more federal judges because uh, a lot of what's happened is gonna be litigated in the courts and they were already trying to set up roadblocks to make sure that people who have been wronged don't have any recourse to go and get those things addressed, mm -hmm. right? So we have to also look at not just one picture but I think collectively all that's impacting us. Mm -hmm. um, but, but on the law enforcement locally here, um, it's sad to say that we've seen an uptick in violence in the city. Uh, you know, the, the murder rates are a little ahead of where we were last year uh, in the violence. Uh, I'm just shocked at the, the violence that's taking place in our communities while this is going on. Yeah, that that if for you to say that, the Larry Ellison, I, I'm I'm mortified when you're seeing 17 year olds and children. Uh, I, I know someone uh, in my extended family 
who knows someone who was killed during this time period and stuff. People are supposed to be on lockdown. And so we're dealing with these issues. Uh, is it, so what I'm hearing you say is that our fundamental issues within the community, they haven't gone away. We just have a virus on top of what we're already dealing with. Is that uh, the way to look at it, though, Larry Ellison? That's absolutely. That's very uh, much what's going on. You know, I would I would have thought that just the opposite, that, you know, this would be a time when folks would say hey, we need to be pulling together. Uh, we shouldn't be tearing out on our communities. Uh, we should be protecting folks in our community, making sure they're safe. And, and, and I'm not saying that that's not taking place because, like I said, there are folks like Monica and them out there on the ground that are making a difference. But there are also folks out there who are creating havoc and they've been doing and they continue to do it. And so folks are out there, you know, every day trying to make sure that folks are safe. Um, mm -hmm. Those and myself who are first responders are putting ourselves in harm's way. Every time we respond to a call of that nature, that means you have to really get close to paramedics, to doctors, and they're already overwhelmed so right. now you've got to take someone out because shooting someone is not something that has to happen no so true so true we uh and mari can you give us your contact information that's being asked for in the facebook uh, chat we have put uh cuff ferguson's biographical profile in the facebook chat so that's there imari give us your info mari you may want to take yourself off mute and share your information with us. All right, here I go. Sorry about that. It, I, it was uh, I was saving my internet last time. I know I lagged up. So my my social media is Ask Imari, uh, A S K I M A R I, and you can find me across uh, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Uh, and the organization uh, is Parenting Journey, uh, ParentingJourney.org. Uh, we do have a fund. Um, uh, we are giving direct uh, dollars to families, um, very uh, light process. Um, we, we have raised a, a couple of about 20, close to $30,000. Uh, and we're awesome. trying to give out $200 checks to families across Boston, uh, Cambridge, Somerville, et cetera. So parentingjourney.org is the organization. Uh, Ask Imari is uh, my social media and that's the easiest way to connect. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And again, we've put Cuff Ferguson's biographical profile in the Facebook lead. I want to, uh, in the Facebook uh, post, I want to bring on uh, Dominga Martin to continue with Larry this conversation about where we go from here, looking at it from public health, safety, civics. You're a filmmaker, award-winning filmmaker. We actually were uh, privilege to have your mom with our first group. So now we have the mother daughter connection. What are your thoughts when you look at it from an artistic perspective of where we're headed and what's taking place with COVID-19? Dominga Martin. Hi. Well, first, I just want to say I'm really humbled to be on this panel. Uh, I am a daughter of the movement. My mom has been an activist since I was in high school. I am now the arts ambassador for the state of Massachusetts for DESE. And although I work for DESE, I'm not here representing DESE. I am here representing uh, myself as an artist, as a member of this community, as uh, someone who has been impacted by the trauma that uh, violence in this community has created. Um, like I said to DESE uh, some months ago, uh, we are in a state of emergency. Uh, with the educational system. We were in an epidemic before the pandemic. And so um, where we go from here, my greatest concern has always been the youth, has always been my community. Uh, we are at a uh, disproportionate uh, rate of teachers versus the growing population of youth of color. 92% um, teachers who are white in this state uh, my role, just to give you some insight, is to help to implement solutions for cultural responsiveness and um, inclusivity. And so we're already at a disadvantage when you don't have any Black teachers. So when we think about where we are right now with this pandemic, we were already uh, food insecurity, already uh, dealing with drug addiction, already dealing with violence in the community already dealing with health inequities, already dealing with inequitable classrooms. So now you have this compounded trauma, not just with the youth, 
because like the detective said, the uh, homicide and the violence rates are going up. So you've got to deal with compounded trauma. You got to deal with the students who are not getting lunch anymore. But not only do you have to deal with the students, you have to deal with the educators because they already can't engage the students. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing now with uh, prison uh, to uh, school to prison pipeline. So I think where we go from here is we need more trauma counselors, we need more nurses, and we need more black teachers, period. Black teachers, teachers of color, teachers who can come in and deal with these children who are in homes uh, with families who can't afford to feed them. There's a lot going on and there's mm -hmm. a lot to unpack. And I think that what needs to happen uh, with our community is that we need to begin to come together and come outside of our uh, individual silos and start to work together. Like uh, Brother Amari said, we need to start to build relationships. And maybe from this, it was abnormal before. We have never lived a normal um, existence in America, period. So what comes out of this is we really need to maybe for this generation, uh, develop our own, our own 10 point plan for this generation, for our community. And so those are my thoughts and that's where I'm at. Well, the, I mean, you, you brought a very important part in terms of the educational piece, the disproportionate number of uh, teachers of color who need to be involved. I'm gonna add one to that and that's heightening and, and, and making it a priority for our leaders, whether they're educators or otherwise, to become technically proficient, uh, using video conferencing, dealing yeah. with online learning. Uh, again, I, I'm teaching Zoom tutorials now for free because I've been using it for four years because I know that that's where we're headed. So it is, in addition to what you're saying, preparing ourselves so that we can um, uh, face what we need to face from an online perspective. I want to bring State Senator, former State Senator Diane Wilkerson on to this conversation with you and Larry Ellison. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, 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 Domingo, would you give us some contact information about how people can stay in touch with you and your important work? Yes. Yeah, so uh, straight across the board, Domingo Martin, IG, Facebook, uh, Twitter, I'm more... Uh, I'm on IG, so that's the best place to reach me. And that's Instagram for those who yeah, don't know what that is. Instagram. <laughs> right. And it's D-O-M-I-N-G-A, D-O-M-I-N-G-A Martin. Mm -hmm. And you can find that on any of the social media platforms. Don't leave us. Okay. Diane Wilkerson, come on board. Talk to us. You have uh, seen a lot. You know what's going on. Where do we need to go in terms of policy, procedures, et cetera? Diane Wilkerson. So Carol, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so what I want to do, and I, it's overwhelming, but here's what I want to do. I want to basically let the audience know right now that I actually find myself having changed my whole way of speaking in the last two or three months. So it's much more stark and much more direct than people may be used to, because I think that we want to make clear exactly what has happened. So I talk about body stacking up. Yeah. I talk about policies that, and when you peel away, when you have a policy that says that if you have a comorbidity like uh, asthma or diabetes or heart disease or high blood pressure, then you're gonna be at the bottom of the pile because we have limited resources and we can't waste them on you. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that to me, I dubbed it uh, the official policy for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was save the white people first. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and you can, you can, you can, you know, argue that there's, I don't know any other way to interpret it from what I saw. So there's not a whole lot of, of issue for me of how we got to be where we are, but I really want to just talk about what happened last night, because I think Kevin won't be bothered for me to tell this story. Um, Kevin Peterson, and I, have been on opposite sides of the issue probably for the last decade on a whole host of things. The, the reason I say that, because I want you to know last night, I picked up the phone and I called Kevin. And I said, I'm looking at your program for tomorrow. I saw the program from last, uh, the, the first town hall, completely impressed with what you're doing. There is another black 
Boston Black COVID-19 Coalition that is inf informing. And in fact, a little bit farther ahead, we've come up with a whole list of demands, not requests, because I think we've passed the point of make of asking, of requests, and we ought to be on the same page. Because the, uh, the professor talked about fear. I'm gonna tell you what the biggest fear in this whole process is, is that people open the door and find all of us on the other side sitting in the same room together. Mm. Because our history has been one where we've been pitted against each other. Right. <laughs> Right? right? Think about this. We started this, people are forced to fight for resources. And we started this pandemic um, clocking in at less than half of a half a percent of $670 million in city contracts with the family assets of $8. I think the things probably Sagan talked about. And so that's where we started. So right. it's been said twice already that I heard, who, nobody wants to go back to that. The, the, the sole focus of my existence right now is to do everything that I can. I'm a policy person. Uh, um, I know where the, where the skeletons are, but where the, the old skeletons are buried. Mm -hmm. I'm a policy person. We, my sole purpose is to do everything I can to keep us alive, mm -hmm. to live in that next quarter that we talk about, because I think it's that dire. It yeah. is, it is in fact that dire. Yeah. So so here we go. Um, we have official state policy that says that the limited resources that, that we have to care for people are to be doled out based on the healthy people getting it first. The healthy sick people get it first and the sick sick people get it last. It was so obnoxious that the, that the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate first time ever in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where the leaders of the legislature chastised the governor for a policy that they even said was racist. Mm. That's never happened before in the history of the Commonwealth. That's how bad it was. Forced them to go back to the table. So now we have a policy that is, I think, a whole lot more responsive, but it's still not making much sense. So when you talk about the families in Boston, the families that Monica is talking about, the family that Amari is talking about, that's what I see every day. We remember, we have to remember, we started off this process with a, with a city where 75% of our black families were headed by single women heads of household. And 60, 60, 65% of our children uh, live or at or above poverty and, and, are, and are eligible for free school uh, breakfast and lunch. Mm -hmm. So that's where we started. Right. Our seniors are, are, now I'm not talking about the seniors in senior buildings. I'm talking about the seniors that are home. They're home hungry, mm -hmm. struggling with trying to figure out how to get food. Yeah. So we have children going to bed hungry right around the corner from us every night. And there's some things that we have to do. So mm -hmm. I've been raising money for the very program that you talked about. We've raised almost $10,000 for Leonard already. I spent one whole day just mm -hmm. on the phone calling so that he could buy masks. Mm -hmm. wow. No one should be in this situation. Monica said it best. We chastise, we assume that kids get on and off the bus with no mm -hmm. mask. Did it ever occur to anybody that they didn't have $15? That you would have to, you would have to pay for something that everybody says is a life-saving piece of equipment. And so we're gonna give away as many masks as we can find. Yeah. We got connected with, B, with BG. The coalition is about 40 people. We sent a letter to the governor already asking for a meeting. We sent a letter to the mayor, a letter to the city councils, informing them of the letter that was sent to the governor and mayor and asking for their help. Right. And so people, so, and we're not trying to reinvent a wheel. This no. coalition is consisting of organizations that are already doing things. Mm -hmm. And our hope is that if we're successful, we'll disband, we'll make sure we get our economic piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. Kevin said, I'm there. And so I'm hoping that all of the new democracy uh, members are on board with us because when we do that meeting with the governor and the mayor, mm -hmm. we wanna have a representative body asking those questions. Mm -hmm. I think it's fine that they have a task force that the mayor's appointed. It's fine that the governor has a task force, but guess what? Not one of those task force members called anybody I bet and said, let me ask you what you think we yeah. should be doing. It's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good know. point. We yeah. know that this is not working. We right. know that the hotspots are real. How we, all you have to do 
If you don't believe me, call George Lopes, yeah. call Rebecca and ask them what, what their schedules are like. They would have five or six funerals in a month. Yeah, we're talking about uh, Lopes Funeral Home and, and Davis Funeral right. Home also. Right. Yeah, and and, and, and no, knowing- so Time to go to work. Yeah, knowing it's Diane together. Wilkinson, we go way back. She's my sorority sister as well. <laughs> The work that she has done, Diane, give us uh, contact information. And then, Larry, I'm going to ask you closing comments from the three of you. Give us your contact information that you can share with our audience. Diane Wilkerson. So contact information, I would say, for people to send to BG. That's the Black Economic Justice Institute. And they've taken the lead. And I'm, telling, I'm talking people like Dr. Tia Martin. Uh, sh who's brilliant, Cher you know, Cheryl Crawford, Louis Elisa, Black Directors Network, um, BG. We have a whole, the NAACP. And, and, and Atia was our speaker two weeks ago also. Exactly. So we're, we're already exactly. speaking the same kind of language. Two things exactly. I want to share, and, and I want to quickly bring Larry and then um, um, Dominga on again, just very quickly, and then Diane. I want to give you on... the contact. I'll close out, yeah. Okay, now give us give us the contact information. Did you? B G B capital B E J I I two thousand fourteen at gmail .com. Okay, say My it again. My email address is new day one word new day dot d w. My initials fifty two, which happens to be my birthday. Figure that out. Newday.dw52 at gmail.com. We want we want everybody involved. We just talked to Tito Jackson on board. He knows. He was we two weeks ago. He was one of our language. speakers. Awesome. Exactly. Awesome. I, I'd like um, for Larry and um, Dominga quickly and Diane quickly, 30 seconds or less to give your closing thoughts from this segment that we're going to bring all of our speakers back for the remaining time that we have uh, so that they can bring their comments. There are lots of questions that we have received. We are addressing them as best as we can. There will be a transcript of this particular program. Two things I want to say. Number one is that the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, they are watching this program and one of their representatives is in the Zoom room. So she's been with us from the beginning. So churches are already on board. We would definitely not leave them out. And number two, if you don't vote in November, shame on you. If you do not vote in November and the elections that will come before November, shame on you. We've got to have a sea change in November and it's going to be up to you. Larry Ellison. Uh, I just wanted to give you a uh, contact. It's Mamlio, one word, Mamlio Inc., one word, at gmail.com. And as I say, you know, we, we can do better because we deserve better. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dominga. Yes, well, uh, everyone was so dynamic. If I could just uh, mm -hmm. pull everything together, I would say that I would like to see a cohesive agenda for the needs and needs assessment of the community. Um, top of the list being equitable classrooms. Uh, and, and more uh, active engagement uh, with the youth. The youth outreach program saved my life. I was first published at the age of 16. Mm -hmm. That is why I am, um, I went on the journey to become a filmmaker and journalist. And I returned back home from New York City so that I can give back to my community um, and was thrust in, in the educational system. But um, more balanced classroom, uh, equitable teachers, who are culturally responsive to the students that they engage uh, with an emphasis on the black communities of Roxbury, Dorchester and Mattapan. Awesome, thank you so much. Diane Wilkerson. The economic pie, we have to fight to make sure that when the dust settles, you know, and as the, the, the pie is being divided, one of the things that most people are not aware of is that in the state of emergency declaration as we're in, all the bidding processes go out the window which is why you haven't seen one single bid for anything that you're seeing on TV. It's all being done by direct designation, direct contracting. And I can guarantee you that none of those contractors are black folk. Mm -hmm. And so my fear, and I know that Sagan is carrying this weight. And I'm not sure that people appreciate the energy and the time it takes, but let me tell you something. If we don't do everything we can to make sure that this economic pie is shared. We're going to have the kind of economic implosion 
that we will not be able to get out of for years. If they're saying that 25% of the, of the businesses won't survive, that means 50 or 60% for us. Our, bis our, our restaurants, our, our beauty parlors. And so there's a lot going on. We just want to be able to support people for the talent they have. Carol, you um, have been responsible for making sure that there is a medium for people to talk and share information because it's gone. The whole the, the Black, Boston Network TV, BBN, it's closed down. And so this kind of a function is absolutely critical for us to be sharing information doing Facebook Live. I'm going to do one on voting. You just talked about that. So people understand what's happening. But I want people to be connected with BG, work, you know, talk with Kevin about what the new democracy coalition is going to be joining us so that when we are facing down the governor and the mayor and our congressional delegation, that we will be a unified front. It scares them to no end. We won't survive unless we do it. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, if you are interested, if anybody is interested in learning more about Zoom, I'm running free Zoom tutorials in May. There are five that are scheduled. I'll schedule more if need be. You can check on my Facebook page, Carol Copeland Thomas. Go to my website, samename.com and sign up. It is free. And I'm excited about technology and where we're headed because you're not going to make it unless you have some kind of technological uh, efficiency that you're running. So we, we have our, our panel is back. We have just a few minutes left. They may have some closing comments. And um, we had M Malia Laozu is busy with banking information. She sends her regrets. She had to go on and take care of banking materials and information. Kevin Peterson, any uh, thoughts as we talk to our committee as we wrap up this part two of our town hall? Well, I, I, I do want to, again, express the um, profound uh, appreciation for the folks who, who agreed to come on the line uh, this evening. Uh, there, there are two takeaways for me that, that, that um, can be gleaned from the first meeting uh, two weeks ago and, and a meeting tonight. And uh, they both uh, focus around the idea of, of self-care. So we need to do some self-care just in terms of um, uh, someone mentioned reconstructing ourselves. <laughs> so, so we have a plethora of um, private nonprofit institutions that could be better uh, in, 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 in the wake of what we've, what we've been experiencing. But we also have to uh, engage self-care just in terms of demanding what we, what we ought to demand from the public sector, our city government, our state government. Um, people uh, have, have criticized me over some times about using Faneuil Hall as a metaphor for the, the disproportionate treatment that Blacks have been impacted uh, around in Boston forever. So the, the, the using Fannie Hall as a metaphor goes to the beginning where people were sold as slaves, Peter Fannie owned slaves. And if we don't get to have those, if we don't have those um, significant conversations that go back to how we begun, then we can't fix the future. Uh, I've tried to, um, and Diane, thank you, Senator, for calling me last night. It was, it was a very rich uh, conversation, um, and, and we'll follow up. Um, I'm glad to know that there, there is the clergy sort of uh, operating around uh, COVID-19 and, and, the, and the Black community, and I'm happy to hear that um, Diane, you, and BG, and all these other groups have come together. It's important for us to look at reconstructing civil society in Black Boston by, by having the honest dialogues that, um, that, that uh, Cuff has alluded to. Um, uh, if we don't do these, have these conversations and we don't engage uh, honestly in moving uh, to the future, then we've failed ourselves. That's right. So we have to, we have to look at um, uh, our internal, non, you know, informal, nonprofit, institutions, including the Black church, and began to think about how these institutions need, need to be better moving forward. Um, but we would be remiss uh, in, in, if, we, if we fail to respond to the, the racist superstructure 
that that has kept uh, uh, black people That's in right. Boston and, and and across the Commonwealth um, um, uh, at a disadvantage. Amen. So I'm happy to hear uh, Senator Wilkerson that you are um, that you remain passionate. And that you bring that you are bringing your 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 genius around policy to bear uh, about um, basic demands around fairness for Black people in the city uh, in, and in the Commonwealth. Uh, there should be clear statements made over the next few over the next few weeks about what uh, resources uh, need to come into the Black community so that we begin to do all the things that we've been talking about uh, tonight. So it's, a, it's an inside and it's an outside game. And uh, you know, I'm happy to be connected with some of the clergy around, around the city. I'm happy to, to oversee a, non, a small nonprofit. Um, uh, it is, if, if, if we don't use our knowledge, our history, our capacity um, uh, to demand those things in the public sphere, then we, we, we failed ourselves and we will continue to uh, we will continue to live in a, a crisis situation. We in the black community. Tara, can I add, add a, a perspective? Carol, go ahead, Carl. go ahead, go ahead, Carl. Yeah, I was going to add one one perspective around this, and it has to do with the actual the issue of uh, love and mm. fear. And the perspective I want to add is this: um, when we think about love and fear, love or fear actually is called forth by our reasoning, and it influences our state of being and where and how we focus our consciousness. However, love and fear actually cannot occupy the same space, time and space. That's right. That's right. So love itself actually sees no barriers. Fear does. So what I want to encourage us to do is to choose wisely what we believe or what we reason to be true. Uh, and so we reason, you know, that uh, community unity is important, and we believe that. Then the kind of things that we're talking about in terms of justice, dealing with uh, disparities and so forth, fuse the vision that, that moves us forward. Yeah. Right. However, if we move by fear, uh, <laughs> it keeps us uh, limited. And so it's important then to, to move out of that spirit of love, um, surrounded by knowing that there's a sense of unified consciousness that focuses on things like the, our collective economy, focuses on things about uh, how we move toward our, our health and well-being. Uh, it moves us then in a very different direction if we're coming out of love versus fear. Love does not see barriers. Fear does. Uh, did, we, did, we leave, did we lose Carol? I'm here. I'm back. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> the magic of Zoom and Facebook colliding, and I'm back. <laughs> well, this has been absolutely powerful. Um, Thank you, each of you, again, for your, your insight and the passion that you bring to, um, to what you do in this city. Uh, I'm so glad to know you. I'm so glad to have worked with, um, I think, each one of you at some point or the other. Uh, thank you again for your contributions. We're going to combine. I know some people probably want to sign off with a couple words, but um, just in terms of moving forward, uh, I'm looking forward to catching up with um, Senator Wilkerson offline to figure out what steps, just in terms of um, policies, what, what, what steps are needed, uh, uh, how detailed can we, do, we get in terms of those, those steps uh, in terms of public policy. Um, but, uh, we will compile uh, the, um, the comments made tonight into a transcript, probably by the end of the week. Uh, we'll combine that with, with part one 
And so we will have a community document that reflects two weeks, four hours of conversation uh, about over a number of dish, different issues that hopefully Senator Wilkerson will inform um, what we're talking about in terms of um, policy. Mm -hmm. um, not contradict it, but help inform it. Uh, so we want to work, work together on the same page. If we don't, we, we fail the next generation. That's we, need right. to, we need to be very serious about that. Okay. Um, uh, Gary, Mike, actually, uh, Gary Webster wanted to make a comment and also um, Julia Mejio, who was part of the city council, is on Facebook. She's been watching this and she's listening and learning. She wanted to make that clear. Uh, Gary Webster, are you still with us? He had his hand up, so that's why I wanted to acknowledge him. Gary? And I, while I was, Gary, are you still with us? I know we had a technical glitch where I was uh, not with you for about five minutes. And uh, Kevin, while I was gone, I, was, I came in when Cuff was talking. So um, did we have comments, closing comments from our panel uh, one and two, um, including Sigon? And um, those of you who are watching on Facebook, you're probably seeing the face of Beverly Williams, and she's one of the senior liaison persons with the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization. So she has also been taking notes and copiously listening. So Kevin, I, th I think Gary is, is gone and it may be a few technical difficulties and let me just check my feed. Okay. Um, all righty. We're, we're all gonna wave goodbye with Kevin's signal. And again, this is uh, to be continued with Kevin. We're gonna wave goodbye, uh, but everyone please stay on. Our Facebook live stream will end but if people can stick around for another uh, two minutes or so, we can we can wrap up formally. So, okay. goodbye, y'all. Goodbye. Bye. Right. <laughs> Good night.